Today, we're in an everything bubble. More and more market participants are talking about rising inflation and the everything bubble being the build up to an epic crash. But is this really true? Can markets go anywhere but up? So far since the beginning of 2020, oil is up 103%, gas 94%, copper, which is key in all our electronics, is up 126%, iron, the most used metal, is up 150%, coffee is up 101%, corn 78%, wheat 49% and sugar 87%. The housing market is up, the collectible market is up and the stock market does not look any different. We've got um, S&P record high, NASDAQ up five in a row, uh, first time since January, uh, VIX below 16. Running hot? Maybe a little. Or maybe the economy is just growing at a really fast pace. Looking at the ratio of market value to GDP, however, the markets are extended over a large margin to where they should be in relation to GDP. So what's going on here? Are we really in an everything bubble that is going to pop? And if so, how can you invest so that you make money? Before we can answer these questions, we need to understand what a bubble is. A bubble is defined as an economic cycle characterized by a rapid increase in market value, particularly of asset prices. It is commonly accepted that bubbles arise due to the psychology of investors. They can appear across single assets, asset classes or entire markets. Bubbles always follow more or less the same pattern, as we will see when we look at some bubbles that have occurred throughout history. At first, things start slow as the smart money and early adopters get in on the trade. More and more professional investors start to pile in, as the price starts to increase, leading to awareness of the opportunity to rise until it breaks into the public. As more and more people learn about the trade and jump in, because of greed and fear of missing out, price starts to really take off and run away from fundamental valuations. It is this stage where mass psychology gets more and more amplified, feeding into itself, leading to enthusiasm turning into greed and delusion as prices reach higher and higher. The stock market is a zero-sum game. The profits of one market participant are another's losses. The more retail is buying, the more profits the smart money are taking. This then is one of the most telling signs of a bubble. Retail investors coming in and pushing prices ever higher, left to hold the bag when the smart money ultimately leads the market lower in taking all their profits. Famed investor Jim Chanus is warning about exactly this and just said in an interview with CNBC. Problem with getting more people, the retail involved, is it always seems to happen toward the end of every cycle, right? I mean, retail wasn't there in 09 at the bottom. Um, they weren't there in 02 after the dot-com bubble collapsed. They were certainly there in 99. And, and so the problem in the last few cycles, as I see it, is that we get promoters and insiders, and people have done very well cashing out as retail is buying. Let's take a look at some of these past bubbles to see how they stack up to where we are today. What is widely considered to be the mother of all bubbles became known in history as tulip mania. It is one of the prime examples showcasing how irrational behavior leads to asset prices rising to unsustainable levels before they finally collapse. In 1630, Tulips, which had only been introduced to Europe in the 1600s, were starting to be perceived as special and rare. This prompted speculation in the tulip market shortly after leading prices to increase by 2000% between November 1636 and February 1637, before plummeting by 99% in May 1637. During this period of time, some tulips were costing as much as a house clearly showcasing the disconnect from fundamental values and the greed and mania involved, which are key characteristics of bubbles. One can't help but see the parallels in looking at prices that some digital or physical collectibles are commanding these days. CryptoPunk and Axie Infinity are just two examples of NFTs that can cost much more than even the most lavish of mansions. The most expensive CryptoPunk so far has been sold for $8 million. The most expensive NFT so far Beeple's Every Day's The First 5,000 Days sold for a staggering $69 million. Is it a bubble? I think there is a very good chance there could be a bubble. But also, many physical collectibles are commanding hefty premiums with the most expensive Pokemon card having been sold for $369,000. Almost a bargain in comparison to some NFTs. Well, to be fair though, at least when the price of NFTs approaches its fair value somewhere closer to zero, you will always still be the proud owner of your virtual good, whereas the tulip will not only have lost its value, 
but have withered away completely. In the 90s, the internet was a rising star, and with it, many companies trying to commercialize its tremendous potential. Venture capitalists caught on early, and in easy monetary conditions were throwing cash at dot-com startups. The public started catching on in 1995, and retail trading became more and more popular. Everybody was sure that there was nowhere but up for internet stocks, no matter what they did or whether they even had revenues. In 1997, record amounts of capital flowed into the Nasdaq. New online brokers were making it more accessible for the average Joe to buy and sell shares, and everybody was buying into the trade of a lifetime. At the height of the bubble, the advertisements were showing that trading is an easy way to riches. It's time for E-Trade. The number one place to invest Between 1995 and 2000, the Nasdaq rose by 500%, from below 1000 to over 5000 points. When nobody was left to buy, the bubble finally burst, and the Nasdaq lost nearly 80%. At this point, even blue chip tech stocks like Intel were down by 80%. What followed was an extended bear market and a slow recovery. It should take until 2015 for markets to recover to previous levels. The dot com bubble actually spawned another bubble on its own, as investors fleeing stocks piled into the real estate market. This became known as the US housing bubble, which in the mid 2000s collapsed, leading to a worldwide economic crisis today known as the Great Recession. To support the world economy during this time, the central banks of the world started implementing quantitative easing, basically increasing the money supply by lowering interest rates and purchasing assets in order to help the economy recover. At this point, unprecedented amounts of money were newly created and injected into the economy. So a big thank you to the sponsor of this video, the US Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve is now letting you print your own money and if you use my code, you will get even more free money. Okay, kidding. The sponsor of this video is the like button, so please smash the hell out of it. If you smash the like button right now, I will give you a picture of an invaluable NFT. Okay, it's not mine, but here it is anyways. As we've seen, these bubbles develop and burst over and over again, following the same pattern. The reason for this is that financial markets, like the whole bubble dynamic, are entirely driven by human psychology, which is best illustrated in the different phases of bubble or market cycles. Fast forward to today. We have been in a central bank induced bull market since we came out of the last recession in 2008. In 2020, Covid hit. And as a result, the markets collapsed and millions of people lost their jobs as the world battle lockdowns that led to stores and factories closing. The world's central banks jumped in swiftly, injecting more liquidity into the system than ever before. They cut interest rates to zero and started large asset purchase programs in addition to the government relief programs, handing out money to everybody. Just between March and June 2020, the money supply in the US increased by 300%, the largest spike ever. 40% of all dollars in existence were printed within the last 12 months. As we've seen earlier, this flood of new money combined with supply chain shortages caused by Covid led to rampant price inflation throughout different asset classes within a short amount of time. It sure looks like we're in bubble territory, but where are we within the cycle? One key characteristic of any bubble nearing its peak is the involvement of the general public or retail crowd. Therefore, the degree to which retail investors play a part in the current boom cycle plays a key role in understanding where we are in the bubble. So what does the data tell us? Since the beginning of the pandemic, the amount of retail brokerage accounts opened has skyrocketed. Robinhood now has 18 million users, almost doubling the amount of users before the pandemic started. They introduced fractional shares, allowing you to start investing with as little as $1. The advertising message is everybody is an investor. And I guess, in a bubble, everybody is. The interest for trading has spiked online and offline. You know it's getting sketchy when your little niece asks you for stock tips. I mean, I had my 18-year-old niece asking me, you know, what stock she should invest in because her friends are making 30% per day. But there's not only more retail trading, the new traders are also younger and more inexperienced. A large part of today's market participants has never even seen a market correction of more than 10% let alone a true recession. It is no surprise then that these investors are over-optimistic and cannot believe the market can go anywhere but up. The only thing more telling than the growing number of retail traders is the amount of money that has been flowing into the market. Over the last 25 years, global equities had inflows of 727 billion USD cumulatively. Now hold on tight, 
because this is truly crazy. Global equity inflows for 2021 annualized amount to 1 trillion USD. Yes, that's right. Trillion, not billion. Almost 300 billion more than have been flowing into the market over the last 25 years combined, coming in in just one year. Over 80% of these flows have gone into passive funds, all US, all large cap. At the same time, margin debt has risen to historic highs as well. Market participants have never been this leveraged before. These days, in the light of the Fed support, there's only one mantra driving the crowd. Buy the tulip. Uh, buy the dip. It seems then that retail is indeed all in, or at least getting pretty close. Looking at these unprecedented huge inflows into equities and the retail trading frenzy, it sure looks like we're in the last cycle of the bubble. But how and when is it going to pop? There are currently many challenges ahead that might trigger a bigger correction or crash, leading to these bubbles to burst. Lower vaccine efficacy and the spread of the Delta variant is impacting supply chains, putting more pressure on already elevated prices and slowing down the Chinese economy. The Fed, starting to taper into a slowing recovery, might as well be a recipe for the crash that we have been waiting for. But whatever event is going to trigger the sell-off, everyday margin depth is growing, the resulting margin call avalanche that will ensue is getting bigger and bigger, making sure that whatever correction we will see will not be a small one and might even trigger a recession. It sure seems like the central banks are running out of options and it will be very interesting to see how they respond to this. So when is this going to pop? It is very difficult to time market tops or bottoms due to the psychological nature of market cycles. As we have seen when looking at historic bubbles, they can stretch on for years before they reach their peak. As they say on Wall Street, the market can stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent. In the past, the yield curve has been a great leading indicator to detect a recession ahead. Of course, there's no guarantee this will be predictive again, but there's a good chance, since ultimately it is down to smart investor behavior. In any case, watch out for the yield curve in wording as a warning signal. Nobody knows what event or chain of events will cause enough market participants to panic sell and trigger a crash. However, being aware of these cycles and roughly what part of the cycle we are in allows you to manage your portfolio in a way that you can make money instead of losing it. As promised, let's look at how to do exactly that. Let's assume that your portfolio is already well diversified. Now your goal is to maximize your profits and minimize your risk. Therefore you want to have liquidity available to buy into a crash and at the same time protect your existing portfolio from losses. There are different ways to do this, but my preferred way is to keep taking profits on a regular basis on all my positions. The resulting profits are partly held in cash or liquid inflation protected assets and the other part is used to build a position that is going long volatility. The current market has very low volatility. The only way is up and there are only minute corrections to the downside that are immediately bought up. This means the VIX, a measurement for volatility, is trading at relatively low level. A big correction or crash in the overall market will lead the VIX to spike up. Thus, going long volatility while buying the VIX with futures, options or ETFs earns our portfolio excellent protection from the crash. If you balance the VIX position in your portfolio out correctly, you can easily cover all losses with the VIX position all the while being liquid enough to buy into the crash in order to profit from the recovery that will inevitably ensue. There's only one thing left to do in order to protect your portfolio and that is to subscribe to this channel. Trust me, your portfolio will thank you later. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.